Tuesday night, Tehran's police chief said they had detained six young people in connection with the video. Hashtag Free Happy Iranians is now trending on Twitter and Facebook. Farah Williams has also made a statement. It is beyond sad that these kids were arrested for trying to spread happiness. Take that, Pyongyang. Moviegoers packing hundreds of theaters nationwide on Christmas Day to see that controversial film, The Interview. I got a body ticket last night, first chance I got. And, um, you know, I want to exercise freedom of speech. Does the EU's right to be forgotten ruling amount to censorship? A journalist for Canal Plus was detained by pro-Russian forces at a military post in the Ukrainian town of Simferopol. The court has now sentenced prominent rights activist Zainab Khawaja to 16 months in jail. A new secular law has been introduced in Nigeria, with homosexuals now facing up to 14 years in prison. The U.S. government shut down airspace surrounding Ferguson at the request of police who wanted to keep news helicopters away. The moment journalists in Egypt learned the cost of just doing their jobs. It's right with studs and lies. I mean, just because he's offensive, is it right to shut him down? This is part of a pro-democracy sit-in, a protest against the Hong Kong authorities. Two assailants fired into the cafe through the window. A discussion event was underway entitled Art, Blasphemy and the Freedom of Expression. People have turned out in their thousands to join solidarity rallies to honor the victims of the Paris attacks. these ones I'm used to those ones is this all right yes. fabulous it's horrible when your voice isn't heard um, it's <laughs> so I did that um, ladies and gentlemen it's been an absolute joy uh, for me a, a real privilege to be asked to um, host this evening's event and um, my name is Shappy Corsandi and I was so delighted that you started uh, that VT with the happy um, video oh you're taking photos can I can you do another one I just look more natural just Thank you. Thank you very much. I rarely get to do that in my profession. Um, they, they, are, they are proper Iranians. That's how I see Iranians. I'm from Iran. And those young people there uh, are, are what I regard as, as, as true Iranians in the spirit. And I, I have to be quite uh, Iranian this evening because it's uh, the Iranian New Year. We had our fire festival last night. Thank you. <laughs> We had our Iranian um, ancient fire festival. We jump over fire and we, and we give our sickness to the fire and get from the fire health and vitality. It's our national health service. <laughs> I fear also soon to be the British national health service. Um, now, I know that I was asked today because I have a bit of a link, I guess. However, um, distant uh, with Index, my um, father was published by Readers International years ago, and he wrote for Index on Censorship in the late 70s. We moved to Britain. Uh, I was six years old when we became refugees from Iran, because my father is a writer. He was a journalist. He is a satirist. And um, as, as, as all of you in this room will know, that the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran are very strong advocates of free speech, but they're <laughs> is very little freedom after <laughs> you have spoken. So writers and artists and politicians, we scattered. And it fascinates me, all the wonderful nominees and the judges here who, who, who are people who, despite the consequences, need to do what they do. As a child, I didn't understand why my father got death threats and carried on writing. I didn't understand why he didn't do a plumbing course. And he'd try and explain to me that otherwise you're dead. If you don't speak, if you can't speak your mind, you are dead. And when we talk about free speech, and I look at um, the life that my father's had, often that means you exercise your free speech. It makes you horribly unpopular. 
It can make you terribly unpopular. In 1997, uh, Iran had a moderate leader, and my dad, remembering the Ayatollah and how he trusted him, was against this man, against this man. And even his own friends were like, come on, but he was adamant you can't have a moderate under the Islamic Republic of Iran. And that's the trouble, you see, when we don't speak out. Powerful characters get in with promises. Uh, I mean, I'm, Farage comes to mind. Farage comes to mind, look, where people need strength. They need strength. And my next door neighbor, she, she wants to vote UKIP, you know? And I, I always preferred the EDL, I'll be honest with you. You know, we, you know what I love about the EDL? They're so honest. So I went on an EDL march and I, did, I, I went on the EDL march because, um, I'll be honest with you, I've got a, a dreadful sense of direction. And I'm from the 80s. I go on a lot of protests, you know? I, I don't always check the cause. I go into restaurants going, what do I want? Table for two, where do I want it? By the window, please. And I love the EDL because they are proper thugs, you know? They're, they're proper thugs who were terrified of CCTV cameras and the EDL were on the streets of London and they were shouting uh, and then because they're scared of the cameras, they had their hoods down low like this and their scarves up like this going, ban the burqa, ban the burqa, which is... <laughs> Give them an education and they're UKIP. Now, the point is that I love the fact that they can, they can do their thing on our streets. They, their views differ to mine. And coming to Britain in 1979, I remember Sunday night for my parents, Sunday day for my parents was Speaker's Corner. My parents, coming from Iran, couldn't get enough of Speaker's <laughs> Corner. What? You can say anything in public and they don't kill you. <laughs> That's incredible. And my... Um, my father carried on his work in exile in Britain, and it was lovely. I got the phone call. I got an email from Index, and uh, they sweetly asked me, um, this is a delicate question, Shafi, but is your father still around? <laughs> That's the tragedy of exile, of being an artist in exile, working in a language that isn't your own, uh, means actually you lose your own people. And people think you're dead, but you can't. That's preferable to being in your own water, in your own place, and not being able to speak. Now, I get upset when I get trolled on Twitter. I get upset when anonymous people on the internet uh, um, shout at me. I, I was on a, a, a debate program called Free Speech, which is that question time for teenagers. And we were debating um, same-sex marriage, and I was for same-sex marriage. Got home, people were screaming at me on the internet, you're going to burn in hell, your views are an affront to God, you looked like a horrible person. I thought, who better to talk about this to than my dad? My dad, who in 1984, Scotland Yard, uh, Scotland Yard uncovered a plot to assassinate him here in London. And I went to The Hague uh, to get the transcripts of my, uh, the trial of my father's would-be assassins. And in court, these two men that were going to shoot my dad were described as a fat man <laughs> and a very fat man, <laughs> which I think was disappointing to my father, because I think if you're going to be assassinated, you want a slick Alan Rickman type to do it, not Tweedledum and Tweedledee. But, you know, there was a part of him, I think he was delighted, because, you know, a, a fatwa is the Iranian regime sort of equivalent of an Oscar. <laughs> now... When I was a child, knowing what my dad did for a living, um, it was very often that I would pick up the phone uh, as a little kid and someone would go, I'm going to kill your father, I'm going to cut his throat. I'm like, Dad, it's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Uncle Hassan. And I did the only thing I could think of doing, age 11. Um, I wrote a letter to the Ayatollah Khomeini. I thought I'd try and reason with this man. So I wrote a letter, and I remember writing, Dear Ayatollah, my dad is really nice. He makes jokes up about everybody, even me. Please, I, I was sure that if he just met my dad, he'd like him, because everybody does. 
And he said, and I said, um, please come to our house in London and meet him. My mum will cook us dinner. She's an amazing cook. Our address is 65A <laughs> Maidley Road, Ealing, London, W5. Right. And when I went to The Hague, I got, uh, I got my hands on my dad's actual death order, which was signed by the Ayatollah himself. And they had written, the writer Hadi Sandy is to be shot as he takes his children to school. And in bold, underlined, was written, the children are not to be harmed. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I thought he must have got my letter. <laughs> so after I was trolled on the internet, I thought I'd speak to my dad. I said, Dad, can you help me? I'm really upset because these people are being really horrible to me just because I expressed my opinion. And my dad goes, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How many messages of hate did you get? And I went, it's at least 50. And one of them says, I've got fat legs. <laughs> and my dad said, 15 messages of hate. I am so sad for you. That means your career is not going very well. <laughs> when my daughter tells me 5,000 people hate her, then I think you are becoming a success. <laughs> and then Mr. Exiled Satirist starts lording over me, showing off peacocking around my kitchen going, you know, after the revolution, tens of thousands of people spilled into the street, chanting for my execution. <laughs> oh, those Halicean days. I can still hear them in my ears. Death to Khorsandi. Death to Khorsandi. Look at you. Nobody even wants to kill you. <laughs> My friends, they ask me, is Shappi dead yet? <laughs> I say, no, she is not very ambitious. <laughs> so it's a joy to be here, an absolute joy to be here. So welcome, everybody, to the Index on Censorship Freedom of Expression Awards.